Francis Rapport. I'm Professor of Health Implementation Science here at AIHI. I've got great pleasure in welcoming you all today to the AIHI Lunchtime Seminar and enormous pleasure in um, welcoming our guest speaker. Please come in. Professor John Overett Veit, who's come to us all the way from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, where he's the professor and director of the Institute. Um, John's reputation goes ahead of him, and I'm not going to say a lot about John in this introduction, because I'm under strict instructions to move swiftly on. And I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming John. And we're very, very interested to have you here, John. Thank you for coming to talk to us about scale-up systems for faster, more widespread take-up of improvements in healthcare. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've tried to put something together that's uh, reasonably varied and interesting that would be of general interest. Um, but uh, let me take you through, first of all, let me say something about the three key messages. Um, some of the basic ideas I wanted to get across. Uh, the first one is, if we go on at present, I think public health care is unsustainable and I'll say a bit more about that, but um, the widening gaps between demand and what we're able to provide uh, for the finance. Um, and we, I think we need a sense of urgency about what to do about this. And to take a, a really much more serious approach, otherwise we won't have a public system in 10 years time. Um, <clears throat> I think one way to approach this is to find um, across Australia there are one of the things you do really well is you have lots of local innovations I think the word was used needs must especially in rural um, and there are lots of clinicians nurses and doctors who are developing models of care that are locally appropriate and actually save an enormous amount of money and provide better quality. Um, so there are lots of these all over the place, but they never get really identified or scaled up in any significant way. And um, I'm not assuming everyone would copy them exactly, but there are ways to scale them up with a whole variety of local adaptations. Um, so I think you're missing a trick at that, but one reason is that, that this industry, this public healthcare industry, has uh, an underdeveloped capacity for transformation. So both the, let, let me put it this way, your transformation technology is pretty non-existent, as well as your capacity. A little bit's been done on quality improvement you have certain capacity for that um, and you do things called strategic planning but the actual grunt to make it happen um, is missing and that's a lot of what I'll be talking about. I think there are some reasons is and as, as I leave early tomorrow morning um, uh, and you'll never see me again maybe I can say these things one thing that struck me is across across the country in the different places I've been visiting and workshops is I want to be fair because it's not 100% true but largely your physicians have got used to a very comfortable existence and no one seems to be willing to take them on in any significant way um, and I think um, they have done enormously well out of the current system and I think they need to wake up and realise it's in their interest to protect and maintain a public healthcare system for this country. Um, and uh, they, the physicians in this country, in my view, need to become much more ready to change and willing to lead change um, because there's a lot at stake here and I think they need a wake-up call and I think leaders in their association should should lead that. And that's one way is that you can develop the effective and capacity to transform 
but if you're having a lot of physicians who are being passively stopping things happening or not on board, um, not a lot will happen. The alternative is, is, of course, is to bypass physicians, which is one approach pe people are taking, and use nurses working at the top of their license, supported by decision support, and non-physician models of care. Um, and I think a lot of that is being done uh, uh, in the background. I think also research, as we have, um, we're, we're at fault as well. Um, I've been working in this business for 40 years, and I, as a professor of health service research, I can honestly say 95%, if not more, of research is totally wasted time and the money is wasted it's not and there are some areas which build up knowledge which are quite useful but largely it's for the careers of researchers and to fund universities it is not actionable by leaders in healthcare and we need to get a sense of urgency and to innovate in our research methods to produce actionable knowledge that people can actually implement and to change our research practice to work much more closely with clinicians and managers and leaders so that we better understand the issues they're facing <coughs> and that we can work with them and develop more appropriate knowledge. And I think the divide between academia um, and the industry or health services also is part of the problem. Uh, so let me put it another way. Um, life is too short not to do useful research. And I hope, if nothing else, what I talk about gives you more of a sense of urgency. I know it's, it's the, the academic system is perfectly designed to produce the results of those 95% irrelevant research. Um, but I think there are changes in um, uh, research reviewers' uh, approaches, and I think more research foundations are moving in the direction of looking at implementation of more useful research. So I quite understand what a nightmare it is to get relevant research funded, um, given the medical monopoly on health service research and, and the methods that they use. But uh, uh, why I'm here is because this institute here, the Australian uh, Institute of um, Innovation, is one of the leading ones in the world doing practical applied research. And it is the place to be, I think, to take this in further steps. And I can say that because, you know, I won't, I won't be here, you won't see me again. And that's my honest opinion. So I think you need to be thinking about tools and guidance to convert your research into usable approaches that people can use. And a good examples of this are quite a few of the Veterans Health Administration research that work in close partnership with their operations. In fact, operations fund a lot of the research. Anyway, um, moving on. Uh, I'm going to talk about the point about the need for, for change, some of the challenges, give some examples and look about research opportunities and make suggestions. Um, Enrico Enrico Carrera has uh, used this, it's, it's from other people, but he's simplified it and done it very well. Demand for health services, funds and staff, sustainability gap. Um, and the general point is pretty obvious if you run many scenarios. Which do you think, these are our technologies to enable people to change their practice to use new, better ways either their clinical practice or a service delivery model of care. Which of these do you think are most effective? Publishing in professional journals, um, continuing professional development, clinical guidelines, um, giving access to computers, computer alerts, decision support. How about feedback on adherence to best practice? Or payment 
for adherence. Some of these are methods that are beginning to be used to encourage or push uh, uh, change, but generally they're not terribly effective, uh, of limited effectiveness. Or put it this way, are we changing fast enough in a wide scale enough to make the changes we need to make? Um, let me put it another way. Do you know of any examples of effective care that are not used in routine clinical practice 100 metres from here at the Monash or any Sydney hospital? Do you know examples of inappropriate care that are given or low value care, some of which is actually harmful? Um, how long on average, does it take for research to be taken up into everyday practice? You, you know the one, don't you? How many years? 17. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it varies tremendously. In fact, there, actually there's a really good study done by the British in two hospitals and they found actually, they, for a certain number of treatments, they, would, they were up to, in 85% of cases, it, it were following best practice. So it's, you know, varies. So the point here is how good are our methods for enabling the take up of, I'm calling new better ways, new treatments, service delivery models, just better ways of doing healthcare that are different from what we use now. Um, challenges to scale up. Well, one of the things you might look at is examples from other industries about scaling up and I'll just touch a little bit on that before I go back to healthcare and it's a well-known issue in scale up is crossing the chasm here from early stage or pilot into full scale up and it's, it's, it's a well-known problem and phenomena. Um, who here has a child where you suspected an ear infection? For your child? I won't ask you lots of embarrassing questions. Okay, suspected it, it, it's actually quite, quite common with children. 93% um, of US kids at some point suffer a middle ear infection, severe enough for visit. The diagnostic error rate, what would you guess? 10%? 30%? 50%? Wrong diagnosis for that? Well, who, who thinks 10%? Who thinks 30%? Okay, a couple of... Who thinks 50%? Oh, okay. Maybe I'm just asking obvious questions here, <laughs> or leading questions. Um, the CDC suggests antibiotics in 25%. It is 50%. Uh, antibiotics just in 25% of those cases. The usual prescription rate, guess. Yeah, it is 85 now, you can get a de definitive diagnosis in 10 seconds um, and it's using this device which is a, a fairly simple in-ear um, device that uses a, a version of radar and these are quite cheap and you could easily get a return on investment. Now for this, this digital device um, the people producing it have got a, a real challenge now to scale up. It's been authorised and shown to be very cost effective. They've got a challenge now to scale up production and then to get it used in everyday clinical practice. So for people to adopt it in their everyday clinical practice. That's one type of scale up where you actually have a physical product that is a new better way and you have to make more at scale to reduce the costs and then you have to get it in the hands of physicians and used properly in everyday practice. So you're producing it but you're also um, trying to get change in everyday practice. Now with products often the change isn't so challenging. Uh, there's a classical example of laparoscopy um, surgical, a surgery, keyhole surgery, um, many years ago. It just spread like wildfire. Everyone did it and they, we had to slow it down because actually it did need 
different type of training. Your everyday surgeon, there are a number of problems coming uh, when people are using that. Um, uh, so devices and gadgets and physical things in some ways are a bit, a bit easier to scale up and get into everyday practice. Um, so here are some types. If you take a product, you make a prototype, either a new <coughs> drug or vaccine, and then you scale up production. I mean, the obvious case here would be um, if it's, once it's approved, you just put it into a drug production process and bash out hundreds of uh, millions of them. And um, you've got a production system already made that you just put the product in and off you go and you only have to adapt the production system slightly. Um, another concept of scale up is the company. Um, so for example, I've, I've um, been visiting Prof with a, well it wasn't called a IHI, but for a number of years and I've seen this group go from quite a small group of people to a really massive, um, uh, one of the biggest programs of its type in the world um, over a period of years. When you scale up a company, there are typically, it's called the rule of three and tens, that there are really big transitions. If there are three, three startup people then when it goes to 10, that's different operation, then 30 and then 100. These are fundamentally different organisations. And we sometimes don't realise when an organisation is scaled up like that, some of the different ways to organise that are needed. Um, scale up of use by users. This typically occurs when we've got, for example, an internet platform. You know, you, you know some of the history of... Uh, Facebook um, uh, and how increasingly people use it and then the more people use it um, you get into a what, what's called the network effect um, and you get exponential take up when it reaches a certain threshold point. Same with um, uh, Airbnb and, and other platforms that match customers with suppliers in that sort of way when you when you get a certain number. Um, uh, same with smartphone apps uh, and so on. So what, what you do here is that you have ways to scale up a market of users. Um, you also, and this is what we're going to be looking at, is scaling up a practice or a model of care. For example, hand hygiene practices or bundles which are used, for example, in ICU to prevent um, uh, catheter-associated bloodstream infection or ventilator-associated pneumonia um, have a number of changes that will need to be introduced into everyday practice to uh, reduce costs that way. Another one that's used a lot in the States at the moment is transitions in care models. So. In, in the States, hospitals are penalised if they, um, re they admit people after, uh, within 30 days of discharge. So more and more hospitals are using proven uh, approaches, typically education or an outreach worker or a telephone follow-up, um, to make sure that the patient after discharge is okay and will arrange for others to support them or help them to try to prevent that readmission. So again, there are a number of different changes uh, that are made um, to do that. And many US hospitals, sometimes community services, are scaling up these changes uh, quite significantly over the last few years. That would be one example. So. Um, what we've got here is we can scale up production, distribution, sales, and you often need to build a physical system to do that. Um, you, uh, to, to actually produce and sell the new product. Now, one important thing in all of these is 
to make this happen, certain people have to take responsibility and be held accountable for making this happen. So who's, for example, 10 years ago, um, Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. For years previously, Apple had um, made responsible a number of different people and created a social accountability structure to bring into being thousands of these new devices and to have them available in the Apple stores at the right time. And they used some of their existing production, distribution and sales but they also had to change it and adapt it for this new device that truly did change the world. Um, and uh, so over a period of time you had people whose job was on the line to get this into the stores for the release date. And it happens every 18 months, couple of years now with the new iPhones and, and other things as well. Now, is that structure the same as your everyday production management structure? Well, no. Some of the same people who are involved in everyday production may have been involved in that, how shall I call it, the new product uh, infrastructure. But often you would have a whole team, and this is quite typical in, in industry, you'd have a whole team whose job was dedicated to bringing about this new future and making it happen because it needs <laughs> full-time focused attention to get that thing to happen if it's going to be done in time for the target date. Um, so you had an accountability structure, you had a strategy and you also had support systems for this getting this new thing in the shops at the right time. Now, are there differences for scaling up a model of care? Well, um, when we're looking at new, better ways, some of them are drugs and devices, but many of the ones that we're interested in are conceptual, um, like this transition models of care, team-based care, team-based primary health care, or a team-based stroke centre. Um, so these are social... Um, the new better ways are social organisational changes to clinical practice and um, some in these situations you often have a prototype that's de developed by an in innovator for example I saw a, br a brilliant scheme up in Queensland called Monash Watch that was providing support to some of the most challenging patients and it was able to provide support to prevent them having to come into hospital and it was amazingly effective for some of the most difficult uh, multimorbidity older and other clients there so it was a whole model of care um, but it was a prototype a pilot and it had been developed and iterated to now be a very effective model of care um, so you develop them by an innov innovator, now they, the evidence about how effective it is may or may not be researched, so you may have some research into that that produces the knowledge about that and it would produce a description of this social delivery system or this new better way that people would copy or try and do their version of in other places. So researchers or the innovators, we don't actually you know, give a physical device or specification, we, we give a description or an outline of the new better way of working and then other people have to adopt or adapt that in different ways. Um, now with these models of care it's often quite difficult to get the degree of certainty that clinicians want about how effective it is for a number of reasons. 
and also you will always need to adapt or do a slightly different version of it in different places. So one of the things is we can't be 100% certain. The, the challenge of putting a version into practice in our hospital or in our health center, there are more challenges than simply buying a device and getting it used. It's a social model of care. So to be fair, there are challenges. It also requires sales to multiple customers. You have to sell the model to clinicians and others who may have to change their practice if they're going to adopt that model. Um, and you have to scale up your sales and take that seriously if you're going to scale, scale up these things. I, I won't go into the different, some of the classic differences between services and products. And what this typically means is that the pilot is, or the new better way is stuck at this pilot stage, or there's very, very patchy take up for these social, um, social or service delivery models, these social practices and things like that. So I think the main point I'm making is scaling up some of the changes to practice or models of care that we're mostly interested in is definitely different to scaling up production of a consumer device or a, a, you know, a product to get to market. But yet look at the professionalism and focus that people in industry give to developing their prototype and then scaling it up for the market. Look at the attention given to marketing, the attention given to it being in the shops at the right time and all of those things coming together. This is a professional major thing because they know the future of their industry depends on this innovation going to market and being successful. Contrast that with what we do in healthcare when we discover a new better way and what happens to it. So that's, uh, that's one of the points that I wanted to make. Um, one of the issues is the product and market fit. So does the model of care fit the demand and the environment? And this relates to some of our thinking that, well, one of the issues is you won't get scale up unless the environment is nurturative to or is encouraging or, or it gives a place for this new thing. Um, and you usually need to get some sort of market, what's called market traction and enough people beginning to use it so that peers will sell it uh, rather than the product innovators. And you need this accountability organisation to do it at scale and you need data to make accountability real and to track it. And I'll come back to these ingredients when we look at it next. So what I'm going to do is to give you a really, a really interesting scale-up example. And I, I thought I'd use this one example um, in, in tribute to Hans Rosing, Rosling, who was one of our professors that, that died about six weeks ago. Um, and he, he was a very famous epidemiologist. And he gave most of uh, the, the um, years of his career to improving global health, international health. And one of the things that he developed, uh, this was to do with selling the point to ministries of health in developing countries. Um, and as a, as a really, really good teaching aid, and you, you can go to it and use it uh, anywhere. It's called the Gapminder. But I'll show you an example uh, from that uh, of scale up. So let me, uh, let me go with this. What you see here is 1800 2010. So you've got a timeline here of 200 years. 
what I've put it on the model here is maternal mortality. Um, and we measure maternal mortality, the number of women dying um, around childbirth, usually in childbirth or just after, per 100,000. And um, a thousand women dying out of a hundred thousand is a pretty, pretty high number. And even in developing countries, we're usually around 400, 500. It's still high. One of the Millennium Development Goals is to reduce maternal mortality significantly. I've forgotten the exact target. Um, and generally, places have been pretty good at this. So what I've ticked here is three countries, and we will see their progress in reducing maternal mortality. And we'll start um, with Sweden in 1800. Uh, the Swedish king decreed that every priest would keep a record of birth, deaths, and marriages from a very early time. So we've got records that go way back, and they're pretty reliable, we think, you know, because the Swedes are a bit like the Germans. They do what, do what they're told. And th these, these were um, Lutheran, mostly Lutheran priests, which are a special breed as well. So um, let's look at how we go. So what happens with Sweden is we're around 800. It drops to um, around 400. Um, so we've got a fair drop, you can see the trend in that, even though it varies considerably. Um, and then Australia comes in. So Australia, the first recorded is, um, it shows 674 per 100,000 in 1875, the first recorded. So, um, Australia stays fairly constant uh, till about the turn of the century. And then, interestingly, Australia starts dropping and then around, uh, around the Second World War, significant drop. We think that's probably due to antibiotics at that period. Now, one of the theories is that that these drops, there were not many births in hospital at this period. In fact, if you went into hospital with birth, your chances of dying were probably increased, certainly up until about 1900 or so, um, because of infection and various ways that birthing was managed. Um, so we think this is due um, and there, is, there are records that show this. Um, in Sweden there was a network of skilled women who were skilled in attending births and had built up experience and practice that was passed on. So the births at home were, had a skilled birth attendant who, who knew what to do and this was passed on. And I'm not sure um, how that drop occurred in Australia, but my suspicion is that it wasn't due to a lot more births being done in hospital, but it may have been, my fantasy is that there were a lot of rural midwives and rural nurses who attended people at home and you had a similar uh, thing in, in Australia. Anyway, let's keep going here and we see this, uh, this drops considerably so we've got like 10 per 100,000. But then, notice this, Bangladesh. Uh, we start up at 1,300. And over a, a short period of time, over, really it's, it's about 20 years or so, um, uh, Bangladesh is able to reduce it from one. 1,300 down to, I think it, it, it ends up being about 200 uh, per year. 
So the question is, how did they do that? Now, I wondered, did they do it in a similar way to the way we think they did it in Sweden, which was the skilled birth attendant? Well, let, let me tell you um, my understanding of the story, because Bangladesh is one of the best examples of, is the country that's got, apart from Afghanistan, which is an another one, the country where we've made the biggest difference to maternal mortality and where there's been the biggest change. And the way it was done there is that they used a franchising operation. What they did is they had lots of non-government organisations that volunteered to run the programme across the country. What the programme was is that they trained women to go to the villages and educate and attend the birth. And um, that was what people think led to that significant drop. It was an intentional um, scale-up of very simple methods that were appropriate to the situation um, and low cost and, and it could be done. Uh, so it's kind of an appropriate scale-up technology using a franchise model. Now the second example I'll use is from Kaiser Permanente. So Kaiser Permanente, South California, um, they used a model from North California, uh, the Kaiser there. They increased their hypertension control 44, from 44% in 2001 over 12 years to 90%. So what this is saying is that those people at risk um, the screening showed them to be at risk, high blood pressure and at risk of heart attack or, or stroke. They increased the hypertension control by that number and the heart attack, although this is, you know, association isn't causation, there was a considerable heart attack uh, fall over that period and death from stroke. I know there are other things going on at the same time and it wasn't purely due to their intervention. But you can um, see from the studies there how much could be attributed to the intervention that they did. Now they had a proven model, a, a lot of it, part of it was to do with a, a combination drug therapy that was easy, easy to adhere to. Um, but there are other aspects to it as well. And so it was a, so it was a, a drug and change to uh, primary care practice with uh, staff, uh, nurses and technicians also having a part. And what they had, what you see from this, is they give a detailed description of an infrastructure that they use to scale up so that this um, bundle of changes was introduced into every primary healthcare centre in the Kaiser Permanente system over, over that period. And that describes very well the structure of committees and who was responsible and who put it into practice. So um, what this goes to is one way quickly to summarise how these scale-ups are done effectively is to say, well, you won't get a new, better way into practice unless you have a scale-up system for implementation, or what I call a SUSE. You need a structure of responsibilities, so these people may also have operational roles, but they may be a dedicated structure, and these people are accountable, and there's a project team whose job it is to get this to be taken up you have a plan and a strategy of steps over time and then you have supports and one of the key supports is peers um, in the profession who are advocating for it who sell the new better way but also data systems that will support the scale up and this also showed up in in our study um, looking at testing costing models 
and it also shows up in Yonchoping in some of their um, improvement systems. They have this scale up system uh, dedicated to scaling up new better ways. So these are some of the elements um, and really what I'm saying is you will not get large wide-scale adoption of a proven new better way unless you have an organized professional approach to it and you will need an accountability structure so you have people whose job it is and they're held accountable for achieving those targets you need to have valid data to track the progress you need an effective local project team that know what they're doing and they know how to manage a project to get results and you need um, expert facilitation for that local project team often from a separate organization and you also have to have leaders to establish all of this and also to advocate for the new better way and especially peer leaders from the same clinical leaders uh, from the same group. I think there are three challenges. I think we, the challenge for us is to give research to guide local scale up of particular proven new better ways. And what we would need to guide is how to adapt the new better way um, for a particular organisation and for a particular group of patients because it, it may be a different, very different group to where it was originally tested. I think the second challenge is we need to use behavioural science. The last five to ten years there's been remarkable advances in behavioural sciences that we don't use much in implementation. It's, in fact, it's just not known. And I'll say a few words about that shortly. And um, departments of health and elsewhere really do need to think about establishing these transformation infrastructures. And you won't get take up of new better ways without such a structure. Now the best that we've done so far is, is really what I call a temporary SUSE. Um, and who here has heard of the collaborative breakthrough model for quality improvement? I'm surprised it's not more widely used. It's been used in this country. Essentially what you do is you have people from, typically from hospitals, teams coming to a learning session, and these are every th three months, and they come to the learning session, and then you have the people running the collaborative give simple description of the change to be established and how to measure it and then you also have supports between the learning sessions to help the local teams and then they do a plan do study act cycle to test it on one or a few patients and then do it and this is the classic way quality improvements are done one of the most common used and what we see here is you've got a structure of people responsible for running the collaborative. You've got participants whose job it is to put it in place. You've got supports, you've got strategy actions, it's all planned. And really what I'm saying is that this is a temporary scale-up implementation structure. And it's put into healthcare because there isn't really a permanent, organised, professional infrastructure for finding and putting into place new better ways which is what we have to do if we're going to survive. The other thing to remember is that your success in adopting an improvement depends on the context. Let me put it this way, this is the new better way, it's the seed that you want to nurture. Um, you then have your project team and your leaders who plant the new better way and they water it carefully. You know how it is with plants, you have to get above, well and, and with children. Once they're over a certain age they got a pretty good chance but they need care to get them to that age. <laughs> um, but 
it will not survive and thrive unless the soil is right and you have the right climate. The soil is your organisational context, its culture and how willing the organisation is to absorb and adopt that. And the climate is the financing and regulatory environment beyond, beyond that. This is the change success rule. The idea that whether there's good evidence is only about 10% of the thing. So, you know, we need to be humble as researchers. Just showing that it's effective in one place is only a small part of it. The local personalities and the project team to adapt and put it into place is 30%. But whether 40% of your success will depend on, on the fit with the organisational and wider environment. Another way to put it is if the financing, the way you're paid is wrong, then it won't work. You, you won't be able to keep it going. What, for example, in the States, when those hospitals got the 30-day penalties for readmission, that was the change in context that really led to the difference and everyone using one of these models now. And so it was crucial then. Um, and pay for performance can both help and hinder. Pay for performance is one, one of the features of the context that is extremely important. And New South Wales is looking at and thinking about using pay for performance or value-based payment to change the context of payment for hospitals, possibly physicians, to give a, a context that's more likely to help people adopt it and push it. What, what I'm going to talk about is just two things, a few ideas for researchers, but first, what for me is missing in a lot of scale-up and improvement programs. We, we tend to assume that quality improvement or adopting the new better ways is, is a rational engineering process. What I'm going to say here, my message here is, it's also about human emotions, their tribal allegiances and politics. So it's about, basically it's about Shakespeare as much as it is about uh, particular engineering approaches. Evolutionary psychology. Don't ever forget that we're trying to change daily work that are carried out by tribal primates. It's a blink of an eyelid and we're in these fancy places with technology and things like this. But we're, we're pretty much smart apes and we, we forget that. We like to think we're in full control, we know what we're doing, we're conscious, incredibly clever and technological. Research shows actually we're not. We have to fool ourselves that we're on top. Um, we are incredibly influenced by our peers and leaders. We, we live or die on the respect and approval of our peers. It's not just at high school, it's in our careers. Um, Emotions are extremely, I'm making the distinction between emotions which we may know, certainly many guys know nothing about their emotions. We feel things certain times, but there's a lot of emotions going on all the time. And our sense of identity and self-respect is growing. Um, this is how I put it. There are instincts waiting to pounce whenever our attention fades. So the the more tired we are, the later in the day, the more the instincts start pushing and, and getting a, a, um, a, a higher uh, involvement. Um, so, don't assume it's all about rational engineering. Use behavioural and political science in thinking about the change. And um, uh, this is a, a simple way to put it. Don't forget the amygdala and how it operates. And these are, these are the four areas 
that I, I um, suggest you have a look at to get into this. Uh, evolutionary psychology is very good. Um, there's some excellent neurological science that shows how we react before we were even conscious of what's going on. Decision psychology, cognitive bias, I think some of you may know about that, and then behavioural economics. Um, all of this is crucial, and it's, it's pretty recent knowledge, but it's crucial to thinking about enabling take-up and change, that, that we don't make the mistake of thinking it as purely a rational planning process. It's political, it's tribal, um, and you have to take account of that. So, this is a summary. I'll just say a little bit about the research before I finish off. Opportunities for scale-up research. For example, recently, the UK Health Foundation, scaling up improvement, funding available, um, uh, a lot of interest in implementation research. Um, for us, it's not just will it work in that pilot, um, people need to know what conditions do you need, what, the, what is the return on investment, and we want guidance about how to adapt it. Um, these are some of the things missing from scale-up studies that I did in a review in international health. Um, I think there are great opportunities for us. Um, to enable these new better ways to be put into everyday healthcare more quickly and in more places than they are at the moment. It's a bit of a, it's luck of the draw as to whether anyone hears about it or adopts it. I, I'm proposing we need to be much more focused and professional about this if we're going to save public healthcare. And there are, we, we as researchers need to be much more innovative about how we use research methods to make that possible. This is one model for describing the adaptations that people do. So there, there is some work that we can already use to do that. Uh, Eleven questions to ask about or to think about when you're studying scale up. What is the innovation, the new better way? Who will be the adopting units? How will these take-up units be selected? Are you planning to establish a structure dedicated, a SUSE dedicated to scale it up? And are you planning a phase programme or all in one? Have you done a return on investment estimate? How are you planning to engage and reward managers in this? and monitoring progress, how you're planning to evaluate results, and what's your theory of change and what new skills needed. So that's, that gives you, um, this is just to say if each site makes an adaption, who, who evaluates the adaption to still see if it's still working? Is it you, the researchers, or is it the project team locally, and so on? So I'm going to finish off here and, and raise some questions. I, I've, the main point I've made is we need to have a much more urgency. I think the, pub, the future of the public health system is at stake um, and we can no longer dally uh, in, in putting new better ways into practice. Um, we need investment and systems to do this in an organised way and professionally. I think researchers have a role to play. You have responsibility for getting your research used and doing relevant research. And I think there are research opportunities for more um, applied research, for more actionable. And I think you will need to partner much more closely with organisations doing this to study and, and help that. Um, so, questions. Any surprises? What's your experience of scale up? Um, and what do you think about your responsibilities as researchers?
And I'll finish there. I'm way over time. I'm sorry I've talked too much. So I'm afraid <laughs> we're going to have to bring this conversation to a close. Yep. Uh, please join me in thanking Thank John you very Lange. much.